Hello, and welcome to the screencast on using R to perform non-parametric bootstraps. So this screencast follows from the previous one where we introduced the permutation test uh, as one method of empirical resampling, um, and also the very small uh, introduction on how to use the sample function, which is sort of our main tool that allows us to, to make this quick and make the functions nice and, and clean and short. Um, so go ahead and read in the data set that we, we've been using for this as before, that should already be read in. And we'll start here with the simple function. And you'll notice that this is um, a lot like the functions we wrote for the Monte Carlo simulations for doing boots, uh, for doing confidence, generating confidence intervals. But here, instead of generating simulated data, we're going to use the real data and sample with replacement to essentially generate a sampling distribution for that data. So here, that's what x.boot is in this first function here. And the things to remember that here in the sample call x that's going to just be our variable which we're doing bootstrapping for size is the number of observations that we want coming out for each iteration of the bootstrap which is just generally going to be the number of observations you have in the vector uh, and that's a if you leave that uh, don't include size here at all as an argument it will default to that but most importantly of course is remember that you need to specify replace equals true um, we need to have sampling with replacement and so we do that, we're going to sample that, and then we just simply compute the mean for that. So we run that. And before we go any further, let's just compare, let's do a couple of quick runs, and just compare uh, the observed mean, which is 11.13, with what we uh, get using the bootstrap mean function here. And we can see that it's close to, but not identical to our observed mean which is as expected because we are sampling with replacement from that distribution, from our empirical distribution. And so essentially this is the approach we're going to use to get the empirical sampling distribution of, of this data and of the mean of this data. Um, but of course we want to do this efficiently so we're just going to uh, do n of a thousand, uh, so a thousand iterations and we'll just use the replicate function as we've done before. It happens nice and quickly and as before we can also do this with uh, this, uh, a for loop, so we just initialize a variable to store everything in, and then just write our little for loop here, nothing different, and again it'll be all but instantaneous. And these of course are just going to be independent instances of the same, of, of sampling from the same underlying distribution, so we expect that these two distributions to be very similar, but not, not identical. So let's take a quick look, and here we go, as expected, the two distributions are very similar but not identical and, and the red lines in each case is the location of the uh, empirical, the, the mean, observed mean for, for the uh, sample uh, and here's the sort of the sampling distribution for the means based on empirical uh, resampling. And we can of course use this to our advantage, it's great that we can get those distributions, but let's actually make this useful. So one of the first things we can do is use these distributions to get standard errors, an empirical estimate of the standard error uh, based on the data itself. So the standard error of the mean in the standard way, just the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, is about 0.037 in this particular case. Well, to get the standard error of the mean based on bootstrapping, just like we did with the Monte Carlo simulation, is really we just need to know the standard deviation of those distributions. So the, two, the standard deviation of the distributions of the resampling that we just did in the step above. So we go SD of stat or boot.replicate, doesn't matter which one. Again, these two should give very similar answers, not identical. You see one slightly higher, one slightly lower than, than our uh, value, but it's certainly in the right ballpark. Um, and my guess is if we, instead of doing 1,000, we did, say, 10,000 or 100,000, you would see that those two would be converging on, a, on the same value because they are just independent instances of exactly the same sampling. Uh, we can also use this to get confidence intervals. So here, first, we'll do sort of a quick and dirty calculation of the asymptotic normal confidence intervals, and I will... I won't bother going through this code with you because it's pretty messy and you would have better you have better ways of doing that in general anyways, and that's not the important point here. But the, the basic point is our confidence intervals are from about 11.05 to 11.2. So what we can do to get the bootstrap confidence intervals, we'll use one particular form of them called the bootstrapped percentile confidence intervals. And here we're just basically saying, hey, we just want to look at sort of the 97.5 and the 2.5% uh, uh, 
points in that distribution and sample there and say anything higher or lower basically is, is sort of the limits of that confidence of the confidence interval. And we do, do indeed see when we use this using the quantile function that we get very similar answers. The 2.5 percent is about 11.059 just like we see above and the uh, upper confidence interval 11.206 in this case, so slightly different. And the second instance of doing the same thing with 1000 is going to be pretty similar, 11.06, 11.206. So very, very similar. That actually tells us something right off the bat that the asymptotic normal assumptions probably have not been violated with this data set in a particular weird way. So that's, that's a good thing to know. So even if you tend to use the more classic methods and, and things based on um, sampling theory and, and uh, asymptotic normal um, properties, you certainly, if you have any concerns that your data may not be normally distributed, this may be a, a, a worthwhile way to do it. I generally, for my own work, use this as default. I often don't even bother with some of the, the normal ones, even though they, tend, they can be a little bit narrower, at least in some instances. So it's very important, though, to mention, uh, and I've certainly mentioned this in class, that the percentile confidence intervals can in some cases be biased, and this is something that, that's uh, discussed a lot in the literature. And there's a variant of the percentile confidence intervals called the bias corrected and accelerated confidence intervals that are generally preferred. So we're actually going to just use uh, a powerful library called Boot to do this, but I will make the script available to calculate uh, the BCAs on your own so, so you can see the step-by-step -step procedures. That's a little fiddly, but it's actually not that difficult. So we'll call the boot library, which you should have installed uh, on your computers already. You shouldn't have to install it. It should already come. And much like the way we've written it, we're going to write uh, a little function. In this case, we're writing some, the function without even having to call our resampling. What's in our function here is the thing we want to resample, which is just, again, the, sex, the vector of observations for sex comb teeth. This variable ID, which needs to be called ID, and this is basically going to be telling us what we're going to be resampling along, and we're going to see it's essentially we're going to we're going to do our sampling with replacement along the index, uh, and then the function we want to do. So this could be anything, and we will see in the next uh, screencast how to use this for much more complicated functions. So essentially here we're just going to go mean of y, and we're just sampling along the index of that. So we run that. And then we use the boot func the function actually just called boot, and basically we say, yep, here's our data that we're putting in, the name of the function that we're going to be using uh, for essentially to figure out what we want to calculate, which is in this case just the mean, and it will figure out with ID up here how you want to do the resampling, and how many of them you want to do. So we're doing 3,000 replicates, and I'll explain why in a second. And then we just run it, and it doesn't take too long, and we get uh, fairly quickly, the ordinary non-parametric bootstrap with the original estimate measure of the bias, which is quite small, and the bootstrap standard error, which is pretty much spot on with what we saw. We can also use this to get the various types of confidence intervals that we talked about in class. The basic confidence interval, the uh, percentile confidence intervals that we calculated above, and the bias corrected and accelerated confidence intervals. Um, so we'll run that. And that'll just take a minute. While that's running, let me just explain why I use 3,000 instead of 1,000 replicates. And this has to do with the boot uh, library itself. Is If you don't do at least as many bootstrap or replicates as you have observations, it essentially spits out an error. So in this case, we have about 2,000 observations, so I just decided to go for 3,000. In general, like I said, it's good to go for about 10,000 anyways, uh, so that's okay. All right, we've got our output now. And what we see is that our, we're in particular interested in our bias corrected and accelerated in percentile, but they're identical. In fact, all three of these are identical and essentially identical to what we observed before. So in this case, there's no evidence of any bias. But um, since this is not particularly taxing to do, I generally recommend doing this along with the percentile confidence intervals, whether you do it with um, my, my code or, or using this boot function. All right. So let's go through a very quick example of how we could also potentially use the bootstrap, the basic non-parametric bootstrap, for a statistical test. And so what we're basically going to do here is we're going to take two vectors. We're going to take all of the counts for sex comb teeth uh, from the mutant genotype, DLL, and put those in a, a vector. And that vector is going to be just this DLL.sct here. So we do that. And we're just going to say how many observations we have from it. And we're going to do the same thing for the wild-type genotype. We're just going to grab uh, 
those uh, for we're just going to grab the SCT where genotype equals wild type. And what we want to know is almost a variant of a t-test uh, without without a, a scaling for the standard error, um, but you'll see how we can use that. We're just going to go um, look at the difference between the mean of the mutants versus the mean of the wild type for sex comb teeth. And if we take a look at that, this is our observed mean is about 0.5 sex comb teeth. So on average, the mutants have half a sex comb tooth more than the wild types on average. Okay, so how do we use this? Well, what we're going to do is write a little uh, for loop in this particular case, and we're going to just do a thousand replicates. We're going to store the statistic that we're about to compute, and that statistic um, uh, is just going to be that difference, the difference of the mutant minus wild type, and we really want to know what the distribution of that is. And so for each iteration, we're going to calculate, we're going to uh, use the bootstrap mean that we calculated before, so essentially resample or sample with replacement and then calculate the mean for the sex comb tooth numbers for the mutants, do the same thing for the wild types, calculate the difference for each. And then we're just going to repeat that many times. It takes just a second to run, it's quite quick, and then we can take a look at the histogram. And what you'll see in the histogram, again, this is not of sex comb teeth, but a histogram of the difference between the mean number of sex comb teeth upon resampling for the mutant minus the mean number of sex comb teeth upon resampling for the wild type. And if you notice something here, it's that this does not overlap at all with zero. Um, and one way of, of getting essentially a pseudo p-value is ask, well, how many of these re uh, sampling with replacement of these events actually overlap with zero. And as we'll talk about and we spoke about in class, um, that this is not a true p-value um, because, of course, this has no relationship to the null hypothesis specifically. But it still, to a first approximation, um, tends to work okay. And, sorry, I saw that. So that pseudo p-value, we can, again, just ask how many of the statistics we just computed are less than or equal to zero. In this case, that's zero. Of course, we've only done 5,000 or 1,000 or however many we did here. What was our n? 1,000. So, of course, our actual p-value, we can say, uh, at smallest, is just going to be uh, it's 0.001 or smaller. Um, and we can just do some additional things to make this plot a little bit clearer, just to make, hey, this is what we would expect to see, our null hypothesis over here, and this is our observed distribution. Again, only for 1,000. Uh, resampling points. But I do want to um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, make the point that this is not a true p-value because we haven't done sampling under the null. Um, and there's actually a lot of uh, different ways of doing this. Essentially you can just use a permutation test or you can do sampling with replacement uh, from essentially a, a, a well-sorted mix of the data which is essentially going to give you the same results as a permutation test anyways. Um, so there's a variety of, of ways of, of doing this and if you read some of the papers I've posted on the ANGEL website for ZOL 851, you will see, in fact, that there's uh, a couple of papers on bootstrap hypothesis testing, but I'm not going to go into great detail about them here. And just below, I'm not going to go over it in this uh, screencast, but it's just a particular way of, of uh, looking at the boost bootstrap variance if you want to. But for now, that's going to end this uh, screencast on just introducing the non-parametric bootstrap. Thank you.